Okay, I think we can start. Um, remember everyone, while we are speaking, please to maintain your microphones on mute. Um, I will briefly present myself and the project I represent. My name is Amanda Prieto and I am the founder and director of Amanda Oceano. Our mission is to promote the action to preserve our marine ecosystems. We are called Amando Oceano, which some people that don't know Spanish here, Amando Oceano is a play on words in Spanish, meaning to love the ocean as we like to inspire love for the ocean in everything that we do. Um, you can follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I'll put the link on the chat and on the comment on Facebook Live. We like to have these online lectures regularly in Spanish and in English. So make sure that you follow us for more webinars like this one. Now, now I'm gonna pass it on to my friend Lourdes so that she can briefly present um, herself and the lectures here today. Thank you all for being here. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jundis Maicano and I am a project coordinator in Amando Seano. Uh, today we are very excited to bring in Sophia Emmons, the outreach coordinator and research technician at the Bimini Shark Lab. She received her undergraduate degree in environmental science from Davidson College and her master of science in marine biology from James Cook University. She is starting her PhD this spring on the impacts of ocean deoxygenation on obligate ram ventilating elasmobranchs with James Cook University and the University of South Florida. And on the other hand, we are happy to keep collaborating with Juan Dardis Baez and her project, Little Woman Big Sharks. She has an undergraduate degree in biology and industrial microbiology from the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez and is a candidate for her graduate degree in the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez, focused on the biology and diversity of sharks in Puerto Rico. She currently works as a technician at HJR Reefscaping and as a marine educator at Puerto Rico Sea Grant, as well as being a former Miss Fellowship intern at Bimini Shark Lab, where she met Sophia Emmons. So I just want to say uh, thank you both for being here and for providing this lecture to us. <laughs> Before we begin, thank I want you. to remind the viewers uh, in the Zoom call to keep your microphones turned off to minimize any disruptions for our lecturers and that we will have some time at the end of the lecture uh, to read and discuss any comments or questions uh, that you may have and we will be reading them from zoom and facebook live chats uh, with all that said i'll give it over to you guys to start the lecture whenever you're ready and i just want to welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here Awesome, thank you so much for the introduction. We're both really happy to be here. I know Wanda's spoken to you guys before. Um, my first time, first time caller, long time listener. Um, but I'm really happy to be here and chat with you guys. Seems like it's a pretty cool audience from all over the world. Um, so without further ado, I'm just gonna go ahead and share this. And we'll get it up there. Can everyone see that? Just thumbs up if that works. Cool, awesome. So today Wanda and I are gonna be talking to you guys a little bit about um, the um, Caribbean, um, the research that we're doing with sharks in, um, in this area and um, some of the other options, I guess, uh, for um, marine science. Um, so hopefully you guys learned something new, a bit of an overview. First, we're going to talk about the different shark species that we see in the Caribbean, um, different management practices, um, and these you'll find out are very specialized because it definitely depends on where you are. Um, and then we want to talk about the importance of collaborations um, and different organizations and how they can all be used together um, and how, you know, different scopes will intertwine. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, careers, in, careers in shark science, in case anyone is interested. All right, so um, shark species of the Caribbean, hugely broad topic. Um, I would never be able to name them all, even if we sat here 
um, forever because there's over 500 sharks in the world and anything can be anywhere at any time. Um, even a, a Greenland shark was found in the Gulf of Mexico. So you really never know what you're gonna get um, in any ocean, but I can generalize. Um, I'll start off just by mentioning some of the uh, species we have around Bimini. Um, they're pretty similar. Sorry, the lab dog has figured out how to open the door. So I'm just going to, one second. Rocky, come on. Come on, buddy. Out, out, out. Come here. Sorry, guys. Um, he can open the door with his nose. So sorry about that. Um, the different shark species of the Caribbean that we have uh, in Bimini specifically, um, I have to talk about our model species, the lemon shark. So we see them quite a bit here in the juvenile life stage. Uh, they spend up to seven to 10 years of their lives around the mangroves um, in these nursery habitats. So that's a really big study species for us at the Bimini Shark Lab. Um, and then also the great hammerhead is another really uh, commonly studied species for the shark lab. Uh, Bimini is actually one of the only places in the world where you can reliably see great hammerheads. And that's because they are a critically endangered species and it's really uncommon to see them um, frequent an area. Uh, they're also typically very shy, um, despite being the largest of the hammerhead species. Um, other topic or other species that we study include tiger sharks, um, bull sharks. We've got some projects going on with those guys. Um, black tip sharks. So these are the black tips, not the black tip reef sharks, which are actually only found in the Pacific. Uh, we have the black tip species here, absolutely gorgeous. Um, they don't quite get very big in Bimini, and we assume that the larger adults will move offshore. Um, so we can tend to see them just a little bit when they've just started becoming adults. Um, we also have Caribbean reef sharks, we have um, Atlantic sharp nose, we've got black nose, and we've got nurse sharks. Um, so those are some of the really common um, shallow water species that we see around here um, that you'll likely run into if you ever come to Bimini. Wider Caribbean species, there's some common shallow water species like dusky sharks, Galapagos sharks, um, very commonly confused, silky sharks, um, scallop tamarheads which uh, in theory we should see around Bimini, but it's actually pretty uncommon to see them here. Uh, we even get whale sharks, uh, not in Bimini. Well, there's been a few reports of it, but in the wider Caribbean, there are some. Um, of course, these are just a few to mention, some of the common ones that you may encounter. Um, and then we also have deep water species because we do have some really deep pockets, either on the outer shelf of uh, the Caribbean or even in the Atlantic Gulf Stream. And so these, see the, these are some of the species that we've seen from the deep water, including the big eye six gill, the blunt nose six gill, uh, seven gilled shark, which I love those sharks because they're all named like they look like. Big eye, six gill. It's got a big eye and six gills. Um, as well as a uh, dusky smooth hound, some Cuban dogfish. Um, so really wide variety of what you can find here. And like I mentioned, you can really find anything anywhere. So is it possible that there are great white sharks? Absolutely. Is it possible that there's Greenlands? Sure. Thresher sharks, makos, uh, basking sharks? Absolutely. Um, pretty much because so much of the ocean is connected, obviously anything can get turned around and end up in a place it didn't expect. Um, kind of like what happened with that Greenland shark in the Gulf of Mexico. All right, so um, now that we have a little bit of a baseline about our different shark species, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, the conservation and management principles. So a recent report actually came out at the beginning of last year that's showing that um, over 71% of oceanic shark species populations have declined um, in the past 30 years, which is a really high number. Um, so we're seeing a lot less sharks in across all the oceans um, than we were even in just the 1970s. Um, so that's really drastic and very concerning. There's obviously a lot of different causes for that. Um, shark fishing is obviously the largest category. Um, but that can include anything from bycatch to targeted fishing, um, which would of course include shark finning, which is another aspect um, of shark fishing in general, um, as well as commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries that result in mortalities. Um, so lots of different threats to these guys. And then also some that you don't even consider because of course they are facing um, more global scales, 
such as um, you know, temperature increase in the ocean, um, ocean acidification. So displacement from those abiotic factors can be really difficult for them too. In the Bahamas, actually, um, this is a shark, a shark sanctuary. So in 2011, the Bahamas became the first country in the world to make its entire exclusive economic zone a shark sanctuary, which means that they can't, uh, you can't kill a shark in these waters. It's illegal. You can be arrested or fined for it. Um, there were other countries around the world that had established shark sanctuaries in smaller areas, but none that had made its entire um, countries' waters as a shark sanctuary. Since then, there have been more countries um, that have established this. Uh, this map shows a few of them. Um, but actually, what's more important was the uh, banning of commercial long lines in 1993. So in 1993, the Bahamas decided that they didn't want any commercial long lines uh, anymore because uh, for the most part, essentially what would happen is it's better for the uh, tourism industry, if someone comes in, if they catch one fish recreationally, they have to come to the Bahamas for five days, they're spending money on a hotel, they're eating at restaurants, they're coming back year after year, that's going to be a lot more money than just one fishing boat that comes in, catches a few hundred different fish and then leaves. Um, it's not going to be the same to the economy. So when they pivoted more towards tourism, this is one of the first things to go. And that was actually way more influential in starting to recover shark populations in the Bahamas than the actual shark sanctuary. Um, and that's because a lot of the shark species were either targeted or they resulted in bycatch. So um, it's good that we have the shark sanctuary, but that long line ban is uh, much more important for the population. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, the Bahamas is really big on tourism. It's actually the number one shark dive tourism industry in the world. Uh, it contributes over 100 million US dollars annually to the economy of the Bahamas, which is huge. Um, and people from all over the world really do come to uh, dive with sharks here. Bimini for the Great Hammerheads, there's Tiger Beach, uh, where you can dive with tiger sharks, lemon sharks. Um, so really amazing places around the Bahamas where people want to come and dive with these sharks. Um, not to mention beautiful waters, nice and clear, um, really nice place to be able to actually see the sharks um, and spend a lot of time in the water. So that's one of the main reasons why um, the shark sanctuary was established in the entire Bahamian waters. That's why it continues to these, this day. Um, but unfortunately that can um, kind of put a blockade on further management practices, um, which you'll see in just a moment. So um, it's great that we aren't fishing for sharks and for sure across the world, that is the number one reason why we see populations decline. But when it comes down to smaller areas, we also actually don't think about it a lot, but habitat destruction is a really big issue um, for different uh, fish species around the world. Um, and in particular, here in Bimini, we see habitat destruction affecting juvenile lemon sharks. So I mentioned that lemon sharks can stay up in the mangroves for the first seven to 10 years of their lives. And that's because they grow incredibly slowly. Um, they uh, only grow about 10 centimeters every single year. So by staying in these mangroves, they're able to avoid large predators and they can learn to hone their hunting skills better until they're large enough that they can comfortably leave the safety of the shallow water uh, without being worried about essentially being taken out by a larger shark. Um, but without these mangroves, of course, these sharks are completely exposed to larger predators. They don't have that same security. And that is what we've seen happen um, over the past 30 years in Bimini. So originally, um, this is all North Bimini up here. You can kind of see this is the same uh, little stretch of land. So this is the top of Bimini. In this picture, it's coming from a different angle from the south. And then if you see this point right here in this photo, that's where this point is. So originally in 1980, when uh, the Shark Lab was established, it was established because of its amazing mangrove habitat, because the juvenile lemon shark population was so big here. Um, and then from outside, uh, companies that came to develop in Bimini, uh, in particular, we see Resorts World. Um, they have decided that they would like to turn the top half, at least, of uh, North Bimini into a resort world. Um, so part of that has involved the removal of mangroves and uh, dredging up further into the top of the channel. So making 
those waters in these shallow lagoons deep enough where large boats and yachts can come in um, and dock. So obviously that does one of two things, actually one of multiple things. It removes the mangrove habitat, um, which is not just essential for our lemon sharks, it's a nursery habitat for many, many species, including commercially important species like queen conch and spiny lobster. And it also uh, dredges up a lot of metal. So by digging up all that soil and sediment, a lot of heavy metals get put into the water, uh, which can be very toxic for a lot of the smaller fish. And because now there's deeper water that's going into these shallow areas, larger predators can get into areas that they never could before. So not only do they no longer have the protection from the mangroves, but also they can't even hide in the shallow water. Um, so this is really unfortunate. We, can see, we continue to see this destruction and removal happening. Um, and we do actually see the effects of this. So this is uh, one study that was done here that uh, was completed after a, um, an event or a, a construction event essentially on, on Bimini. And uh, this is just showing how little growth. So I mentioned typically the sharks will grow, you know, up to 10 centimeters a year, usually between four and six centimeters. But the year that there was a lot of destruction there, we see that they grew about three centimeters um, in that year, which is incredibly low, um, can be due to a lot of things, stress, um, lack of food, because of course, if they can't find um, their food, then they're not able to um, eat and they're not able to grow. Um, and um, this was also matched with a higher rate of mortality in the same year as well. Thankfully, we do see that after the uh, construction event that there was a return to normal growth, um, which is good to see, but at the same time for mortality rates, those are numbers of juvenile lemon sharks that will never come back. So we'll never be able to see the same numbers that we see that year um, last for um, the next 30 years or so. Um, so management, uh, incredibly important when it comes to habitat destruction. Um, and everything I just mentioned is incredibly niche to the Bahamas and also to Bimini. Um, and that's because, of course, there's tons of countries within the Caribbean, and they all have different management tactics. Um, so this is just one example of the Bahamas, how even the best case of establishing a shark sanctuary can still fall short if it doesn't include um, habitat protection as well. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Wanda and she will talk to you guys a little bit about Puerto Rico. Thank you, Sophia. So yeah, uh, getting into management that pertains to Puerto Rico, unlike the Bahamas, Puerto Rico is not a shark sanctuary. So there are certain species that are allowed to be fished here in Puerto Rico and some, and some other species that are protected. Uh, for instance, under the Puerto Rican law, uh, the nurse shark is protected by a leading, leading agency, the Department of Environmental and Natural Resources. So far, that's the only species that's protected at, uh, under the Puerto Rican law. However, there are other regulations that are set into place and do apply uh, to Puerto Rico territorial waters. So there are regulations that we also need to follow. Um, and uh, inside this regulations, we have the oceanic white tip and the skull of hammerhead, which are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Um, next slide, please. And there's also the highly, this is a mouthful, so uh, the highly migratory uh, shark uh, uh, regulations. Uh, even though there are federal regulations that do apply to us, back in 2010, Puerto Rico adopted these federal regulations, so they do apply for our territorial water, waters as well. And uh, the species inside uh, these regulations that are prohibited uh, to be retained while fishing under the Caribbean's commercial small permit are the following. If you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So some of, these, of the species that are are under these regulations and that are in fact protected are the Caribbean reef shark, the silky shark, the sandbar, the black nose sharks, and even all hammerheads with the exception of the bonnethead. When I say hammerheads, I mean every shark that has this, uh, the, uh, the, fa the facial structure, this facial structure, which is called the cephalofoil, it makes up their head. So every shark that has the cephalofoil are prohibited for it, uh, with the exception of the bonnethead. 
And furthermore, uh, more species into the next slide. Um, there's also every shark that has uh, an interdorsal ridge. I think that's the probably the the slide that comes after it. So you can go back to the previous slide. Oh, sorry, is it? Oh, it's oh, all right. There it is. Sorry. There we go. Thank you. So sharks, as I was say, saying, sharks that have interdorsal ridge, uh, for except the tiger shark and the smooth hound dogfish, which is also known as Sophia mentioned before, the dusky smooth hound, they are also protected. And uh, the sharks that have interdorsal ridge will look something like this on the right side of the of this slide. Um, those sharks that have like that slightly protruding line in between the dorsal fins on the top of, of the shark, um, that's the interdorsal ridge. Those sharks are prohibited uh, for fishing and to be retained. And unlike the, uh, the sharks, and it looks like this, but that line protruding over the top, and they and that's how they look. And on the other side, you can see a lemon shark as an example of a shark that does not have that interdorsal ridge and is actually to, uh, permitted to be uh, retained under the HMS Caribbean Commercial Small Boat Permit. And uh, further into that on the next slide, the overall the pelagic shark species are also prohibited in uh, within this regulations. And examples of those are the oceanic white tip, which is also protected under the Endangered Species Act, as I mentioned before. And there's also the shark mako, the thresher shark, and the blue shark, to mention some examples of those. Uh, to the next slide, please. Thank you. But um, putting aside commercial fishing, uh, we, when we talk about management, there are some threats that we need to consider in order to uh, come up with effective strategies to protect sharks concern, uh, regarding all these other threats that may even diminish commercial fishing and even made, might it seem to make it look like, as, uh, like less concern in comparison with these other threats. Uh, an example of that is habitat destruction uh, that has been a done for multiple reasons, uh, mainly for coastal development. Uh, here's the recent situation on the top right, uh, top left of this slide, um, where uh, a pool was trying to be constructed but, uh, uh, in the town of Gong after it was destroyed by the Hurricane Maria. So they tried to reconstruct it, but uh, thankfully the, uh, the community stepped, uh, stepped forth and uh, made possible uh, people not going forward with this construction and even uh, it, authorizing for it to be demolished. And for about seven years or so, there was also this situation where uh, mangro a mangrove ecosystem was destroyed and failed in order to do construct uh, coastal development as well. So as M Sophia mentioned before, mangrove ecosystems can be really, really, really important, uh, not even as an ecosystem as a whole, but also as nursery, not only for uh, uh, certain species uh, outside the shark world, such as conch and, and snappers and all sorts of other marine life, but also for certain species of sharks, such, such as the lemon shark. There's also a lot of habitat degradation going on here in Puerto Rico. And an example within this thread, we can mention littering. Plastic is the, the most, um, the major component of ocean trash that we can find. So plastic under certain conditions in the water can leak uh, toxic substances into the environment, not only degrading the environment, but also the surrounding marine life there. And many marine life or well, if not all of them, they can absorb this, this, this toxins and it can ultimately um, affect their functioning, the physiological functioning, uh, such as um, uh, functions uh, like metabolism, for example. So, and they can also absorb these toxins uh, through a process called biomagnification, not to mention that uh, also trash by itself can, uh, uh, can entangle and harm animals in many other ways, such as ingestion. And all over the world, sharks have been found uh, entangled into uh, all sorts of trash, especially shark nets. And ingestion is not considered as much as uh, of a threat for sharks. Uh, if we like put aside the plastic toxicity that leaks into the water environment, 
but it has been reported that it can be a potential threat to particularly sharks that are planktivores. Uh, with this, I mean the Baskin shark, the whale shark, and even the megamouth shark. And all three species have been documented here in Puerto Rico. So they, these sharks, they feed from plankton. So they need to swim through the water to push the, the food, the plankton in the water uh, uh, through their mouth so they can uh, so they can feed. And even also like the whale shark that they have to pump the water uh, through their mouth so they can feed. So either way that they are feeding, they can, if they're surrounded by ocean trash, they can swallow this trash. And it, this brings with it a whole other in, a series of implications, such as gut obstruction, uh, internal lesions, and so forth. Also, something that it might be like um, specific to the Eastern area of Puerto Rico, the US Navy, some 60 or more than 60 years ago, like about 1941, they started uh, using Vieques, the island of Vieques, which is a town, a mini, uh, island town of Puerto Rico, as a, a site of, for bombing practices. And a lot of these munitions ended up in the ocean floor, in the sea floor. And what the problem uh, that, that uh, comprises like th this threat is that these munitions actually are leaking toxic, toxic substances, just like the plastic is, into the water and harming uh, at the same time, the marine, the surrounding marine life there. But not only that, some of these toxins are actually cancerous, and sharks are not exempt either from diseases or cancer. And as you can see here in the bottom right corner, uh, there, the, this is this, a study where uh, a group of scientists back in 2017 documented a female bull shark with a tumor, and they studied the progress of this tumor. So as Unlike we previously thought that sharks don't get sick, we now know that sharks do get sick and they can even get cancer by developing these tumors. So, and something that is very concerning in Puerto Rico so far is that the, the lack of management strategies that actually address the life history traits of local shark populations. No shark is the same. Every shark is different. And their characteristics that make their livelihood different concerning reproduction, survivorship, and so forth can vary from one geographical range to another. So a lot of research efforts need to be put forth in order to study these populations. What are their life history traits so we can implement, uh, develop and implement effective management strategies that addresses those needs for, for the sharks. Because even scientists suggest that sharks, even though they're fish, they should not be managed as fish. They should be managed instead like uh, marine mammals are managed, for example, because their life history traits are, are way more similar to marine mammals than those from fish, to uh, a fish. So if you're doing research, you're interested in doing research in Puerto Rico, I encourage you to do so. Uh, if you are from another university, you want to do, uh, do research in Puerto Rico, please do so and get your permit, uh, get people in your committee that will help you guide through the research that you want to accomplish. And if you're here from Puerto Rico, get someone in your committee, uh, get a, pro a program that fits your interests into what you want to research and get someone in your committee that will help you guide you through those goals of your research. So we need this in order to fill all the gaps of information that we have going on here in Puerto Rico, because there is not much going on. If uh, some initiatives here and there, there's Conservación Conciencia, there's other independent research um, uh, studies as well, but we need more in our order to figure out what these sharks need to develop management strategies that will be effective for the shark populations here in Puerto Rico, especially stock assessments. So like I, mentioning all of this, that we need to consider under management, it makes look it, it makes commercial fishing look like something that is not some that is not too of as rising concern as the other things that I previously mentioned. Uh, mostly due to the fact that commercial fishing here in Puerto Rico is not necessarily industrial. Most of it is just artisanal, and I dare to say that all of it is artisanal. So, artisanal fishermen are not creating a big of an impact as for example, recreational fishers might have been doing, but we don't know that because we haven't done the research to do it. So something that is also of rising concern is that 
a lot of people here that fish uh, the fish sharks do not account with the training or the preparation to actually identify or tell sharks apart. So they might be fishing some uh, of the species, an individual that is a species that is protected, but they don't know because they cannot tell them apart from, uh, from one another, especially with carcharinids, which they are very similar. And like, you have to look for certain specific spe uh, features in order to tell them apart. So you don't know what, uh, you don't know uh, what you're fishing and what is protected if you cannot effectively identify it. So. That's where little women big sharks comes in. You can turn to the next slide, please. Thank you. So little women big sharks uh, is an educational initiative. It's now established as a small company in development uh, that aims to create educational resources such as uh, materials that help you guide uh, to, to guide you to identify shark properly and gives you all the resources and tools to do so for you to determine is the species uh, uh, protected, is the species not protected, can I fish it, can I not? So we're, a, we're trying to make as much educational resource as possible. There's something in the works for that. Uh, so we can help the overall uh, public in Puerto Rico to understand not only identify the predators, but also to understand them as well as a whole. And we also aim to uh, uh, do uh, collaborations such as like what we're doing now with Bimini Shark Lab and Amanda Oceano in order to uh, make the resources and make our lectures as complete as possible for everybody to understand. And in the future, we also aim to create programming courses for uh, Puerto Rican uh, female students and scientists that want to further themselves into shark research or just want to know more about shark research or sharks in general. Um, even though the purpose behind it was this, anyone can join these courses and programs, regardless of whether they are female or uh, they're women or men trying to study uh, sharks here in Puerto Rico. They're open for everyone, but this is something that we have to further develop in the way. Uh, but it would definitely be available for anyone who wants to join. Maybe you can turn to the next slide. And yeah, talking a little bit more about uh, research in Puerto Rico, there are not a lot of opportunities for um, us Puerto Ricans, well, at least here in the island, uh, to get knowledge, get the experience and the skills we need uh, in order to study sharks here in Puerto Rico. So back in 2018, knowing that I was stumbled upon this because there are not much of opportunities for us out there, uh, back in 2018, uh, I wrote to this, I reached out to this professor from the Coastal Carolina University, Daniel Abel. Uh, he offered and still offers the shark biology course. And I asked him if I could participate in his course and he said yes. So I, the first part of the course was in Bimini and the second part of the course was in Coastal Carolina University. And that's how I uh, knew, of, uh, got to know about the shark lab for the first time in my life. So that sparked me a longing to come back and to do an internship. So last year, no, about two years ago, I became a Miss member, a Miss Lafo uh, member. And as soon as they uh, announced there was a fellowship uh, application available to do an internship in Bimini, I applied and surprise, surprise, I got the internship. And it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I actually got to learn so much that I would otherwise not learn about. Uh, we got classes from research skills, from all the way to outreach and education and even administration as well, which was pretty cool. And we got, to, we got as a group to learn from all of this stuff that could be really, really important to know in order um, uh, to, do, to do shark research in general. And also we got to um, expose ourselves, just being out there I learned so much that I know that I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have learned otherwise. So we got to go out there, see the sharks, um, see what we should collect as samples for what specifically, and so forth, so forth, so forth. Even the field observation by itself, just being in the water with the sharks, you you were able to see their behaviors, um, try to understand them as, as best as possible. Because as I, as I mentioned before, no shark is the same. Everyone behaves differently. 
that's something that you can get to know and also use when you're trying to uh, long line sharks uh, in order to get samples from them, like taking it into account certain behaviors and, and certain other, other information about them that could be really, really important at the time you're doing shark research. So even the pictures I took swimming with the shark is something that I can bring back to my, to through little women big sharks to create resources and whatnot. So, and I think that's about it for me. So, but you know, research is not the only thing and education is not the only thing you can do with sharks. And Sophia will get more into that. So I'll leave the floor to you, Sophia. Thank you. Well, um, I can say not just on my own behalf, but including my own behalf that we absolutely loved having Wanda here. She was so stellar. We learned as much from her um, as she may have said that she learned from us. Um, so she was really stellar. Um, and we encourage everyone who wants to, to please apply, um, come to Bimini uh, in any capacity you can. Um, MISS is a fantastic organization that does offer these fellowships. So I encourage people to check into that if you haven't heard about it before. Um, but yes, they, we've talked a lot about science and research and what it looks like going into this field. And a lot of times it can require a lot of education um, and years and years of being in school. I myself call myself a perpetual student, um, which I didn't think I'd be, you know, heading into my thirties still in school, but here I am. Um, but that's definitely not for everyone. Um, it can definitely be um, very difficult financially as well um, to do multiple degrees. So um, there are tons of other options, the ways to work with sharks um, that don't necessarily uh, require degrees. Um, scuba diving is one of them. Um, so this can initially become an upfront cost um, in terms of getting your dive master or dive instructor uh, certifications, but it is a really great way to be able to work with sharks, um, to work with conservation as well. Um, this kind of ties into the uh, guide for sustainable tourism, because of course we want to encourage sustainable tourism, um, not just regular tourism <laughs> like we see in Bimini sometimes, uh, but there are some really great ways in which uh, guides can be responsible with working with organizations like the Bimini Shark Lab um, to bring knowledge to their guests as well as an amazing experience. Um, underwater photography is another really cool aspect for people who are interested in photography. Um, you get to be really good at holding your breath, uh, getting close to animals, and you actually can work really closely with scientists too, um, especially when it comes to things like photo identification. Um, we use them for the great hammerheads, which is probably not a species that people typically think of when it comes to photo identification, but for our individuals, we can identify um, them down to the individual level. So the great hammerheads that come, we know them by name, and we know them from the different features that we've been able to photograph over the years. Uh, but of course, they're used for a lot of other projects, whale sharks, uh, manta rays are some of the bigger ones. Um, but there's definitely a ton of species which underwater photography can be a huge advantage um, for science, um, as well as an amazing career. Um, and then kind of moving away from those roles, fisheries officers is actually a really fantastic job. Um, it doesn't require I think usually typically, at least in the US requires an undergraduate degree, um, but it's a fantastic way to get on the water to work with sharks um, and different fish species and it collects absolutely vitally important data. Uh, without this data, we wouldn't know where stock populations are. We wouldn't know if species are recovering from management efforts, uh, if they're not responding to management efforts. Um, it can also help with even just um, habitat and movement patterns. Where are we finding these different species? Um, so that's a really underrated job, but it's absolutely crucially important for so many scientists to have that data. Um, and then also you're able to spend time on the boat to be able to go out and actually catch these individuals. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be on a boat that's targeting sharks. It can be something that involves bycatch, still taking that data, taking samples, um, necropsies, muscle samples, leech samples, blood samples, um, quick releases wherever possible. Um, so really cool stuff um, in terms of fisheries officers too, if you are interested in being out in the field and out in the water. 
Um, and then of course, uh, policy is also a really, really important one. It's probably not gonna be in the water nearly as much as the other ones that I mentioned, but without these policies, um, so we have the science aspect, but that science doesn't go anywhere without people who are also going to advocate for these policies to be put into place. So we want people around the world to be able to actually take the science, take what we know about the shark populations and use that so that we can create better management techniques and better management practices so we can see populations recover. Um, again, not quite as glamorous, but definitely a really important job. Um, there's so many more that aren't even on this list. These are just some options to get you going. Um, there's amazing organizations for um, outreach as well. Um, this is one of them, really cool. Um, something you can start up if you have a passion for sharks to share. Um, sharks for Kids is one that we work really close with in Bimini here. Um, they're on shark education, if anyone wants to check them out on Instagram. Um, but it's about spreading awareness too. Um, so that's really important, and especially when it comes to sharks. Um, you know, they're supposed to be this really big, scary animal for most people, and we need to change their perception where even if people don't want to jump in the water and go swimming with them, at least we can hope to create a respect enough or relay the importance that sharks have in the ocean. Um, so really cool careers um, doesn't necessarily, there's 101 different ways to get into shark science or to get into ocean science um, that aren't even directly science related. Um, this is an amazing field. Um, anytime you're in the water, I'm sure everyone here absolutely loves the ocean. Um, so if anyone has any other questions about that, or especially about any opportunities at the Bimini Shark Lab, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to share my email in the chat. Anyone can reach out if you have any questions about that, um, or check out our website, BiminiSharkLab.com. Um, and that is all for me. So I want to pass it over to anyone that may have any questions for us. I'll just come out of this screen share here. Cool. Um, I guess we can start with some, um, if anyone has any questions, they can turn chime in, maybe come off of mute or you can put them in the chat. Um, oh, there's a question. Maybe you can answer Wanda in the chat. Uh, Julia is asking, what licensing is required for shark research here in Puerto Rico? Um, what do you need, uh, regardless of where you are or where, or where you're, 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 you're doing your degree from? If you want to study sharks here in Puerto Rico, you need to fill out the application form for the permit uh, uh, from the Department of Natural and Environmental Resources here. So once you get that uh, uh, submitted, they will take about a year or so to get back to you, but I think so far that's the only thing you need. But if you're from outside the island, I encourage you to come visit, get to know people that are already in this field. They might be able to lead you somewhere or maybe even give you an important contact. Uh, for example, a fisherman uh, who knows where certain uh, shark populations aggregate, where their uh, their seasonality and so forth so uh i think it's a good thing to know not only apply for the permit try to get people that are really here doing that so they can uh help you in any way they can so you don't lose time uh trying to figure out where the sharks are what to do and whatnot and what exactly, I think this question is addressed to you, Sophia, what exactly is the role of a fishery officer and is it a federal job or a private job directly with the Fishers Association? Um, great question. So uh, fisheries officers, it depends on the country. I'm more familiar with um, the US fisheries um, setup. So a lot of the times um, it'll be contracted out through different um, organizations or directly through NOAA itself, which is of course a government organization. Um, there are a few different fisheries officers, um, companies uh, around the US specifically that you can sign up for with training programs um, and they will work with uh, government or be contracted out directly. Um, and then, yeah, so it, it depends. I guess there are both. There are some that are through the government and then there are some alternatives. 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is um, in other countries. I know in the Bahamas, it's directly a government position. Um, I don't believe there's any other contracts that are out of the Bahamas. So that would be directly through the government. Um, but check it out. I'm sure that there's other um, places that um, are similar to the US and that they have different companies um, that may make it easier to get fisheries officer jobs. Um, but the role of a fisheries officer is usually to um, be on board on a fisheries vessel um, and they're collecting different data. So whenever there's bycatch that comes on, um, like a, the count of the species for bycatch a lot of the times, um, if there's like a volume of fish that they're keeping track of, um, how many are discarded, how many ca are kept alive. Um, and this can be really, really important data um, for like not just shark fisheries, but overall fisheries in general to know exactly how much catch is being landed with every trip. Um, so really important stuff. Okay, so another question we have in the chat is, how does one report illegal shark fishing in Puerto Rico? Can spots where sharks are hunted be reported to you guys? What is the system for shark protection? I guess this is more for Wanda. Well, a problem that we currently have here in Puerto Rico that you might be aware of is that uh, there's a lack of enforcement of uh, management practices here. Uh, but you can, if you want to report illegal fishing, uh, you should call the Department of Natural and Environmental Resources and make your report. And um, I think there's an office specific for that, but I think there's a laboratory in Cabo Rojo, which have been there a few times. And uh, that's the fisheries lab. Maybe you might be able to call there, make your report and so forth. Uh, but that's, as far as we know, you might be able to also reach out to the natural uh, national, uh, Fisheries uh, Service, I think it is, from NOAA, and also the Caribbean Fisheries Management Council. Okay, thank you. I actually have a question. Um, so it was in the part where you were explaining that sharks with an interdorsal ridge were like more protected. So I, I wanted to ask like why um, specifically. I don't know if you mentioned it, at least I didn't. Um, I couldn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she wants a lot of attention right now. <laughs> I we all we, we both love cats, so we don't <laughs> I think I can speak for Sophia when I say we love cats. So. <laughs> Um, sorry, that your question was uh, why interdorsal rich sharks or rich bat sharks are uh, protected. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just mm -hmm. a feature for like for you to uh, identify, like easily identify whether the shark is protected or not. Is um, okay. some sharks have the interdorsal ridge, some of them do not. So uh, most of the sharks that are allowed to be fished don't have the interdorsal ridge. So it's used as a characteristic. Uh, it's used as a characteristic to help you guide you through what okay. what shark species are allowed to retain or not. It's just a characteristic in general. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, if there's something biologically related to that, I would know. Maybe Sophia can say a little bit more about it. Um, I'm not exactly positive. Um, there may be some aspect that's related to life history, possibly slower growth rate. Um, I'm not sure um, exactly what it is. Um, I can definitely check it out and get back to you on that. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if, if, like Wanda said, usually it's just used as a measure for identifying different species as a guide for like being in the field. Okay. Um, but in terms of the life history traits, why that's, you know, where the line is drawn, I'm not exactly sure. It's a okay. good question, though. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can see any other question. Regarding research finding, what is the process, if there is one, of working with lawmakers in order to develop better laws regarding fishing and marine animal conservation? Um, oh gosh, um, working with lawmakers. So it's a little bit different, um, I guess, depending on the country that you're in. Um, for the Bahamas, specifically with sharks um, and marine animal conservation, a lot of that's not typically an issue because a lot of it already is protected because of the tourism industry. Um, 
but a lot of it um, doesn't come from the science level. It usually comes from NGOs that are advocating, um, just like a lot of policymakers are, um, you know, in around the world where it starts with, you know, being lobbyists um, and then working with people who are actually in charge of laws, calling senators, you know, talking about an issue, holding forums, getting groups that are involved um, that want to actually push the issue forward um, with just kind of like the, the boilerplate of just kind of trying to get anything passed. Um, but in terms of conservation, working with um, departments like NOAA is a really great way. Um, Um, so organizations, um, especially the ones that are through the government in order to back up stuff with, um, with data and science, um, is a really great way to be able to push things through. I don't know if you have any Port Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Here in Puerto Rico, the process that you would normally follow is just to, uh, write to the people, to the house of representatives, uh, no, not write them, sorry, call them. <laughs> Otherwise they will never answer you to be honest. So just call them, set up a meeting, call the, uh, the leading agencies in the field, the Department of Natural Resources, the Caribbean Futures Management Council, NOAA, Seagram, Puerto Rico, and get them all together. Try to like come up uh, with a date and set up a meeting so you can report your findings. Something that you would, you would do that anyway through your uh, defense uh, of your degree, but if you want like a more overall, like a more, um, a bigger meeting with the, with these, with stakeholders, with uh, management officers and uh, overall just policy uh, making, uh, policy decision, decision makers, um, you should call them and set up a meeting yourself to report your findings and see if there's something could be done about it. Also try to uh, visit um, uh, go to the meetings of the Caribbean Fishery Management Council. Uh, you could apply for uh, reporting your findings there and all sorts of, of, of similar meetings that take place here. So I think that would be maybe the process to do that and get people interested in just aware of what you have done and how it can be used and applied to HR conservation somehow. Okay, so there are no more um, questions in the chat. I don't know if anyone wants to open their mic. I think, Amanda, I think you froze. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, Saludos, Wanda. Espero que estén bien. Hola, este, mi, mi inglés es malísimo. So, eh, ¿puedo, ¿Puedo preguntar en español? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, Sofia? Sofia, Sofia knows Spanish. And if, if you yeah. don't get anything, <laughs> um, no. I can translate no. it for you. <laughs> Bueno, 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 pues voy a, voy a practicar en inglés. So, voy a practicar mi inglés, voy a practicar mi inglés. No, este, don't worry. I'm going to practice my English with you guys. Um, I was wondering, um, Bahamas became a chart, a chart century, right? So, in order, in order to, to make Bahamas, uh, or uh, to, to make Bahamas a chart century, uh, I think that the, there had to be a lot of research, which um, included charts, obviously, um, as the main purpose of this research, and, um, and highlight the importance of, of, of these animals. Um, in order to do this in Puerto Rico, um, I'm guessing there has to be a, a lot of, a, a lot of research to be made. Yeah, um, I'll actually jump in. So there actually was, um, it seems like, of course, that would be the natural way to go would be to get a lot of research and then establish this shark sanctuary. 
Um, but actually because the Bahamas is mostly driven by tourism, um, what ended up happening was because there were sites um, or around the Bahamas that was targeted to, um, to sharks, uh, for diving, that was one of the that was the primary reason why the shark sanctuary was established. Um, there was actually a report that came out, um, and this would be you know probably another really great way for other countries to establish this. Um, a report in the Bahamas that found out that one Caribbean reef shark is worth I think fifty dollars if it's dead, and if it's alive, it's worth two hundred and fifty thousand. So it's obviously because, you know, that shark brings in tourism, it brings in people from around the world, which is bringing a lot more money than just the sale of one shark. Um, but yeah, I, I'll pass it over to Wanda if you want to add anything. Um, well, if you want to like initiate somehow shark sanctuary in a certain area here in Puerto Rico, there's a whole process behind it. Um, you can nominate the area, but also try to find out as much as possible if it's something that won't generate conflict uh, with uh, fishermen, because they do help a lot with research. So, uh, and they don't normally fish sharks here, it's, even though there are people that do, but um, it's not uh, is not something that is as often as mentioned because there are fisheries that uh, shark fisheries that are sustainable. There are some that are not. So, but uh, the overall process, like getting uh, getting away from that, uh, the overall process that you might want to ha have to do um, is go to the NOAA to NOAA page in the sanctuary area. Maybe nominate that play, uh, a certain area you want to protect as a sanctuary and. After that, the whole process is really, really big and it's very difficult if you decide to do it alone. You need a lot of community support in order to conduct research on why you want to protect that certain area. And, um, and yeah, and just after you publish the findings and so forth, there has to be a meeting in order to determine what, whether it, it's viable or, or not. So yeah, it's this process. Maybe you can uh, dig more into it. I might not have all the information with me right now, but uh, it's something that you, do, you can do through NOAA sanctuaries, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I think that's basically it. But it's very important that you do the research of your, uh, research, uh, of your own and try to avoid conflict as much as possible because believe me, you will need eventually the help of fishermen and you don't want them on your bad side. Um, no, I, but yeah, I, yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, shark sanctuary is like a really big thing, but the simple mention of the your your Sophia, is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> she said um, there a uh, live shark made um is worth fifty dollars and dollars and. Uh, I mean, death shark fifty dollars and a life shark two hundred and fifty. And if if you see the chat, everybody went like, "Wow, awesome, impressive numbers." If you tell that that kind of thing things to fishermen, um, it's not that they it's not like telling them to stop fishing, but maybe um change their their habits some way. I know it's not gonna be an easy process, but you you can. Um, talk in numbers to them. I'm I'm really sure that um, they fish to to sustain um their families, uh, to sustain the, the themselves. But if you talk to them in numbers like this, I think they're gonna like they're gonna want to um to they want they kind of they're gonna want to be like they're more charging in Puerto Rico. I, I mean. I don't know. Yeah. Is, that's just why my, my opinion. <laughs> yeah, of course. At least the fishermen that I know are very aware how important sharks are to our local waters. So um, they know that they depend on sharks mainly because they also serve as indicators of healthy ecosystems, and which means that they can keep fishing for their, their overall livelihood. But um, yeah, but also if you want to do that, they're very open to talk, well, at least the ones that I know. And um, 
also if you're going to propose that present them with alternatives of what they can do instead if they already fish sharks um, because there's a, that is something that they need if they fish whatever they do fish is something that they need to support their livelihoods and a lot of people don't know uh, like they, that's their career profession that's the the thing that they know so if you're gonna like get into it propose them with alternatives and even try to uh, connect them re with researchers or try to in, uh, make them join you in, in or invite them to with research and to pay them so they can actually see other alternatives of how they can uh, make money from what they do uh, uh, without fishing sharks. Yeah, um, one thing I will add to that too, um, alternative livelihoods like like Wanda just mentioned can be very difficult, especially when it's people's careers. Um, so, you know, one of the ways that we, it's not, you know, something that's gonna happen in the next five years, but um, one way that we're able to kind of ensure that the next generation is more interested in conservation is by talking to like younger school children, especially locals that who would otherwise likely go into fishing, but presenting them with alternatives to, um, to becoming fishermen or fisher people um, by talking about the importance of sharks and why it's you know, important to leave them in the ocean. Um, so much longer game, obviously you're waiting for a whole generation to become, um, you know, the next career people, but um, that's one of the ways that, you know, it doesn't directly threaten um, someone's livelihood um, for the time being, because that can be incredibly difficult, like Wanda said, but yeah, great questions. And um, not just that, I believe sharks are not like incredibly healthy to eat, are they? Yeah, um, Wanda definitely knows more about this, but the accumulation of toxins can definitely be um, pretty dangerous. Sharks, um, as they are, they might not be apex predators in every ecosystem that they are. That also depends on geographical region, but um, as top predators, they're like the, the last um, of of the predators in the food chain in general. So everything that um, their prey eats and what their prey eats, it accumulates inside of them. So if, if, if they come from a place that it's, I don't know, there's a toxic, there, there's toxins laying around um, or, or whatnot, they accumulate all of that, not only what they accumulate through uh, uh, by themselves, but also from what they eat. So, uh, and one of the components that it's, it can be found in shark meat is a methylmercury, which is a very harmful substance, a substance, uh, sub, sub, uh, a very harmful substance if ingested. It can cause all range of <laughs> physiological problems, not only for the animal, but for you if you consume it as well. So it's something that is, it's, it has been noted. And it's also something that it's not, it's not a food that is recommended to eat for everyone. Um, there are regulations in place for that and recommendations as well. But I, I would say that sharks, shark meat is not the healthiest fish you can eat in the ocean, so. Yeah. So um, making sure, uh, Sophia and Wanda, do you have time to answer a few more questions or how are you on time? Yeah? Yeah, I, I've got time. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we have a few more questions in the chat. So Christian Arce is asking, are there any ongoing shark-related research here in Puerto Rico? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, there is um, a, a people from the department, uh, well, the University of Rio Piedras, of Puerto Rico and Rio Piedras. There's uh, also people from the university uh, where I'm from. Uh, that is doing shark research as well. And uh, there's also an organization called Conservación Conciencia, which is doing their own shark research here in Puerto Rico. So, but there's a lot of, in the, not a lot, but a few initiatives and efforts of uh, shark research going on here and there. So those might be a few options you might want to look into, but there are definitely people doing research here already. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, so Lisa Lopez is asking, do we have any data on how many sharks are caught as bycatch or illegally in Puerto Rico? Um, not exactly. Even though there are reports, uh, in this report, sharks exist as a group, not as individual species. So you don't know exactly how many sharks are being caught of which species. And also a thing that you might uh, want to be uh, want to consider is that even though if they might appear in the report as a, as a, as a, a species by itself with the numbers of the report, it is, is this possible that the shark has not been identified accur accurately? So it might be another species, but it's very, very ambiguous. And the reports that I have seen so far, um, you cannot say that uh, X amount of uh, this species of shark is being caught in Puerto Rico, was caught in Puerto Rico from this year through this year, because they are just in, they're in the report mostly as a group, like sharks. Like this number of sharks was caught and this and that. But mm, there's not much detail in those reports. There are different ways. It. Um, that it's uh, bycatch definitely depends on the type of fishing that you're looking at too. Um, so that can drastically skew the results for how much is caught. Um, and that's a, one of the ways that, you know, doesn't necessarily need to be a huge change, um, but can make a huge impact for shark populations is by changing and regulating the different type of fishing that's allowed. Um, so I mentioned that the long lines were banned in the Bahamas, and that was really helpful for sharks. Um, and that's because long especially when they're left out for commercial fisheries can lead to really high mortality rates. So by managing the different ways that people fish, um, that can reduce bycatch, even if we don't have, like Wanda said, the exact numbers, we do know that there are ways that most sharks will react better to um, certain gear types than others. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I have another question here in the chat by Sebastian Grundler. Uh, first, he says that the, la, pres la presentación fue buenísima, so like the presentation was very good, and I also agree. Uh, and then he asks, I see sharks semi-frequently while I'm surfing here in Puerto Rico. I know specific spots where there are more sharks. How can I directly participate in research and data collection? Which organization would be the best place to start? Um, I say mentioned before there are not a lot of research efforts here in Puerto Rico but if uh, you want to get in contact with someone uh, and participate from research you might want to be able to reach out to the students that are actually doing research here there's Dalian Lopez um, there's Aglimar uh, I'm doing more of a theoretical investigation of sharks uh, but I will eventually um, do a more broad research in sharks here in Puerto Rico but if you have any information that you want to contribute to anyone, just reach out to any of us and we might be able to help you. And even if you want to do research yourself, uh, we can um, mentor you and guide you if, if that's what you want. But um, any information you have, I know it's helpful in, in, in a lot of ways. So if you want to send in that information to eventually get involved in research, that would be great too. Uh, but so far, um, I think uh, you might want to contact um, maybe uh, Grisel from the Department of Natural Resources and just put these, that information out there so she, she can have, so she can be like, um, um, she, so she can have that information and maybe distribute it to people that are already doing research with sharks. But yeah, I think there's a lot of things you can do. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone, know, anyone else has any other questions, they can leave them in the chat. They can also turn on their mic. I'll just... Sorry, I'm just gonna put some information in the chat for you. So this is the BiminiSharkLab.com uh, website. Anyone can go check that out. There's information about internships um, and getting involved. Um, we also offer different options for people coming for a short period of time. And then 
Also here is my email if anyone wants to email me directly. I am going to add my email as well. Before I forget about that. Thank you for reminding me, Sophia. <laughs> There you go. All right, so if there aren't any other comments, questions, um, Mighty Newman says, such a good presentation. Thank you all. I think we can, we can close it. Um, remember everyone, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You have all the information from the lecturers here in the chat. Um, for more activities like this one, you can check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, thank you again, Sophia and Wanda. You do not know how grateful we are um, for you guys to be here. So, Sophia, it was a pleasure to meet you. And um, thank you for everyone um, for accompanying us uh, today. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you all and, and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you it's great being here. Thank you for setting your some time apart to listen to us. We're very <laughs> grateful for that. So thank you very much. And thank you for having us, Amanda. And thank, thank you, you, you for the invitation, you. Sophia. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.